So let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 13. And I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Ephesians 4, 7 to 13. Verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might feel all things. And he himself gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. exciting the retreat is next week. Yeah, we've actually set the dates and signed the contract with the Kaya Ridge nearly 18 months ago. So we've been, in a way, planning and praying for the retreat for more than a year. And finally, here we are. It's only a week away, less than a week away. And we'll be all there next weekend. Um, so it's exciting. And also um, that, that God has allowed us to establish our church membership program. And it'll be a really wonderful way to um, conclude that and culminate and actually establish our church membership program. But at the same time, that's not the end. And that's really the beginning of our church ministry. And I'm sure um, that God will work in and through us. And we look forward to his working and his blessing in the future <coughs> as a church. We've, in a sense, um, by having our church membership program, um, laid a very solid foundation upon which the church can do ministry and grow. And we are sure that God will um, do that for us. And our study of Ephesians chapter 4 on Sundays is really um, consistent with that theme. And it ties in very well with our uh, church membership study. The big theme here in chapter 4 is obviously the unity of the church, unity of the spirit. In verse 3, your memory verse for last week, it says, Endeavoring or striving to keep or maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, which is love. So that's the big theme, the unity of the church. Now remember that chapters 1 to 3... Are theological and very um, richly doctrinal. So it contains a lot of doctrines, doctrines about um, our salvation, about the church, that we are all members of the body of Christ. And then chapters 4 to 6 are very practical, and there are a lot of applications there. And the applications actually begin with church unity in chapter 4. Now, as you recall, chapter 5 and chapter 6 tell us about uh, the practical things about living as Christians in the families, uh, in family relationships, and also in workplaces and in the church and so on. But it all begins with church unity, the unity of the Spirit. Because without unity, it would be impossible to do anything together. Think about that. Without unity, it's very difficult or impossible to do anything together as a church. And you've seen that some of you. Churches that have dissensions and divisions and lack unity spend a lot of time trying to have some peace in the church and they rarely have time to move forward and do productive ministry. So in order to do things together, to minister together, we need to have that undergirding unity. And that unity, by the way, is the unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge, full knowledge of Christ. See verse 13, as we have just read, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So this unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge, the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, that brings us to become a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As a church, we become more and more like Christ as we move towards that perfect unity, unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge. And that means also, necessarily, this unity is none other than theological unity. Unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge. In other words, you have to know the same thing and believe the same thing. And that is obviously the doctrines, you know, theological aspects of Christ and God and church and life and so on. And that's why um, having doctrinal statement that is detailed enough and definitive enough is very important to have church unity and to strengthen the church unity. And that unity, by the way, um, on the one hand, we need to have the same knowledge and same faith and same doctrine. But at the same time, the unity can also be seen in practice. And chapter 4 talks about that um, unity that is at work in practice. As it says in chapter 4, verse 3, we are to endeavor to keep this unity, unity of the Spirit that is given to us. And also we are to do this with humble attitude, with sincere heart, with gentleness, with all lowliness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, in verse 2. So this is striving for unity with humility and gentleness with one another. But on the other hand, in verse 7, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now that actually means that this unity, on one hand, is to be one. But on the other hand, this unity is to have gifts given to each one. So, think about that. One, you know, unity, unit, but on the other hand, you've got the diverse gifts. You've got one, and you've got many. And at first, they look contrary to one another. But of course, they're not. They're more complementary to one another. It is unity that allows the diversity, and also this diversity of gifts promote the unit, promotes the unity in the church. We have unity and yet diversity and vice versa. So we are going to go through this passage and learn more about that. But before we do that, maybe look around one another. I mean, look, look around, look to the left and to look to the right, and look to the behind and front. If you look at the person next to you, you know that that person next to you is not the same as you are. You know, different background and different uh, context, different culture maybe even, you know, different ethnicity. You've got all these unique, different diversity. And yet, we are in the same church, in this unity of the Spirit. And as they say, um, I think, I remember one song, a very popular Australian song, that sings like, we are one, but we are many. And that's, in a sense, our country, because we have people from many different cultural backgrounds, and yet call Australia home. So, we are one nation, but we are many people. In a sense, we can say that we are one church, but we are very diverse. But we are going to think about that diversity more biblically. Not in a general sense, but in a very biblical sense. And that's very important. So Paul is speaking about the diversity of gifts that promote the unity in the church here in our text First of all, this diversity, although it is, you know, diversity means to be different and to be, you know, many different things, it is diversity that promotes unity. It is diversity not uh, for the sake of being different and having many different things, but it is diversity that promotes the unity in the church. Now keep that thought. That's very important. It is diversity that promotes unity. Keep the thought and now. 
zoom out. Now we've seen verse 7, but zoom out and look at a broader context of the text. Now this practical session, section, chapter 4, actually gives us the ultimate goal of the church. So it is almost like giving us the destination. And that is in verse 13. It says, till. It says, till we all come to the unity. In other words, until we come to the unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge and full knowledge of Jesus Christ, until we come, come to be a perfect man, and until we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So until we come to this fullness of Christ, and that is, in a sense, the goal. That's the, actually the ultimate goal of the church. If you think about that, it is simply saying that we, be, we, we desire to come to be more like Christ. And until we become exactly like Christ, until we come to the fullness of Jesus Christ, until we come to the full maturity, that's the goal. That's the ultimate goal of the church. Simply, you can say that the ultimate goal of the church is to be like Christ. It is to be Christ-like, to his full measure, to his full stature, to be a perfect man. Of course, the Bible also teaches us that there are many functional goals underneath. You can maybe uh, call them objectives. Um, if you use the terminology of goal and objective, you've got the ultimate goal, and in order to achieve that goal, you might have different objectives or different steps to get closer to that ultimate goal. We can call them also the ultimate goal and functional goals, goals that we can achieve functionally in reality. Like in family relationship, the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 5, 6, this is how you ought to behave as Christian parents and children um, and in your family. And this is also how you ought to conduct in your workplace as Christian work workers or Christian employees. And this is also how you ought to evangelize the gospel uh, evangelize the unbelievers by preaching the gospel and this is how you ought to serve in the church and this is how you ought to conduct in the church the house of God so the Bible teaches all these functional goals that we can set ourselves and obtain and the ultimate goal is to be more and more like Christ both personally and as a church we need to be more like Christ and Christ likeness is the goal and in order to get to that, we understand at the same time that means to be perfectly united. So to be perfectly like Christ means to be perfectly united in the faith and in the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's where we are getting to. And there are some pathways to get to that ultimate goal. And in this text, Paul gives us two ways that can happen. One, as Christ gives each one in the church diversity of gifts. So by giving us many different people with different talents and different gifts, we can get to that unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge. And at the same time, another way to do that is by giving some specific people with certain teaching gifts, like apostles and, and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists in verse 11. We'll have a look at that more in detail in due time. But today, we want to focus on the first part, the diversity of gifts given to each one in the church. And in terms of gifts and spiritual gifts, then we need to think about, then, then how does that connect or relate to that ultimate goal to have the perfect unity? How having different gifts amongst us, how does that help us to get to the unity, the perfect unity of faith and full knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this te text actually teaches us on, on how we might get there and the pathway. So have a look at verse 7 first. Have a look at verse 7. It says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. It begins with the word but. The word but actually means on the other hand. It's like saying, by the way, there's one other thing, and that is that grace was given to each one of us to the measure of Christ's gift. So from verses 1 to 6, basically, Paul tells us that we have unity. Unity of the Spirit, 
You have to keep this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, that is love. And besides, understand that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So there are about seven one things there. So you've got all these already in you, the unity. But on the other hand, one other thing is that there are many diverse gifts given to each one of you according to Christ's gift, according to Christ's grace and Christ's gift. It's basically saying we all receive gifts, but we are uniquely gifted with different gifts. And that means simply we are diverse. We have the diversity. But again, this diversity is the diversity that promotes unity. Not only celebrating the differences, but focusing on how these diversity can work towards unity in the church. And that's very important. So then, let me say this again in different ways. This diversity in gifts is not based on our earthly diversity or earthly qualities. For example, now, the word diversity is quite popular in some Christian circles. They say that, oh, we are a very diverse church. We've got very um, you know, different people from different places. Like, you know, we are ethnically very diverse and very multicultural, uh, multiracial, multiethnic. You know, we've, we've got all different people representing different kinds of people. But this diversity in the Bible has nothing to do with those earthly qualities. Understand that. In fact, Paul tries very hard to dilute that as much as possible. He says things like, whether Jews or Greeks, so whether you're a Jew or a Greek, doesn't really matter, we are one in Christ. He says, whether you're free or bond, bond servants, you know, free or slave, whether you come from you know, free class of people or slave class of people, it doesn't really matter. Whether you're learned or not learned, it doesn't matter, we are all in one body of Christ. The Bible doesn't teach us that we are, we are to celebrate the diversity in these earthly qualities. You know, ethnic diversity, you know, we have that, but that's actually something that we need to forget rather. No ethnic diversity is mentioned here in the Bible as something that we need to keep and honor. There's no racial diversity that is to be celebrated. There's no nationality diversity. There's no political diversity. There's no diversity in um, you know, our different backgrounds and contexts. Sometimes if you, carry, if you get carried away, you, you end up celebrating all these earthly diversities and diversity to, to do with your ethnicity, your nationality, your culture, and you kind of highlight them and forget the actual purpose of the church. And we don't want to do that. The unity of the church is far greater and more important than anything else. In fact, we don't even need to think about this diversity of earthly qualities. We're not too much concerned about that. I mean, they are there. We, we all have that. You know, we are all born in certain places, in certain cultures. So we come with that. That's, a, that, that's understandable. But you know, we don't need to put too much focus on that. It's much better if you just forget that, actually, and just remember that we are one in the body of Christ. But what is then the diversity the Bible refers to? The diversity that the Bible refers to is the diversity of gifts. The diversity of gifts that we bring to the church. That's very important. So we celebrate diversity and we use that diversity, but it is a diversity of gifts. Now let's look at, put a bookmark here and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, if you want to learn about gifts or spiritual gifts, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12. And of course, you can study Ephesians chapter 4. So we'll have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and have a look at verse 6. Chapter 12, verse 6. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. It says in verse, verse 4, going back up to verse 4 in that section, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Now look at verse 7. It says, But the manifestation of the Spirit, which is the gifts, the diversities of gifts that just mentioned in verse 4 to 6, all this manifestation of the Spirit, because the Spirit gives all these diversities of gifts, is given to each one for the profit of all, for the common good of the church. All these diversities of gifts, all these gifts are given to each one of us for the common good and benefit of the church. Put it another way. Christ has given each of you gifts. So you can use those gifts for the benefit of the church. It talks about diversities of gifts. The biblical diversity that is good is that we have diversities of gifts. We have different abilities, different gifts that we can use to build up the church and to promote the church unity. In fact, if any diversity, whether it is ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, or any other sort of diversity to do with our context and earthly qualities, if any of those diversities actually hinders the unity of the church, if, it, if that diversity gets in the way of promoting the unity of the church, then we should do away with that. It's much better that we don't have, we don't need to, you know, we, we don't have that or we don't need to be worried about that so that we can keep the unity of the church. And that's why in our church, we, we are a church with multiple different nationalities and ethnicities and races and so on. And we understand that and we, we are, you know, happy that we are, we are that kind of church. But we don't go out and say that we are the multicultural church or we are the multi-ethnic church and we have these you know, multiple races and, and cultural backgrounds. You know, we don't come every Sunday with different foods from different places and just to sort of celebrate that. That can be helpful, but sometimes if you put too much emphasis on that, then you end up doing that without being the church. Any other, ethnic, any other cultural bodies or clubs can do the same. You can have some kind of club where you have different nationalities and different cultures and they can celebrate their cultural backgrounds by celebrating their cos you know, um, you know, costumes or, or dresses or food or cultures and practice and so on. But, but we are the church. We are the church. The diversity that the Bible talks about is a diversity of gifts. And maybe those gifts can have a little bit of cultural colors. And that, that's okay. You, know, you might bring some... Um, hospitality is from the Philippines and maybe from you know, Ethiopia, you know, from uh, you know, China or Korea. But it is the gifts that you use for the good of the church. And, you know, we, are, we are all you know, creatures of our context. We cannot erase your background or your heritage. We're not saying that. But at the same time, what we're saying is that, yes, that we have gifts just focus on that. We have gifts, diversities of gifts that can be used to promote the church unity and to build up the church. We should never let any of these earthly qualities diffuse our focus on church unity. That's especially important with regard to multiple you know, ethnicities and nationalities that we have, um, especially in multi-ethnic sort of ethnic ministry. And we should know that. We are very perceptive and aware of that. So when you see all these multi sort of you know, cultural churches, um, we can be happy and we can we can praise God for that. But if they focus too much and lean too much towards earthly diversities, then you know we wonder whether they are actually thinking about the diversities of gifts and that they should have the unity of the church that they should promote. Now the early church knew this. So if you look at the book of Acts, early churches came together from all different kinds of backgrounds, uh, Jewish cultures and, and also Greek cultures, um, sometimes even pagan cultures, people getting saved from pagan practices and so on. But they always reminded themselves that they are, whether Jews or Greeks, one body, one body. Look at chapter 12, um, for example, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all members are of that one body, being many, 
are one body. So also is Christ. So many members, but one body. Verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized, or we are all immersed into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So one body and many members. So it doesn't really matter whether you're a Jew or Greek or free or slave. We are all baptized or immersed into one body of Christ. So in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So we have the individual uniqueness. We are all members individually, but we are all one body together collectively. And also remember that um, these members basically do the work. And the work is diverse. Activities are diverse. Gifts are diverse. You all can do different things. You're all good at different things. And you do all that and bring them all together for the unity of the church. And this is crucial. This is crucial to build up the church. And again, that's why we don't celebrate our ethnic diversity as much. Now, we enjoy it, obviously. We enjoy food and culture. That, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But... We don't celebrate that above the unity of the church. We don't celebrate that above the diversities of gifts that the Bible teaches us. The Bible tells us that Christ has given each one of us diverse gifts. So we thank God and we thank each other for what we can bring to the church and how we can contribute to the church. And that's important um, sort of underlying um, in a principle. Let us go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Just remember that first before we get into the actual text. So in verse 7, on the other hand, to each one of us, grace was given. Now grace simply means it's given freely. So even gifts are given to us freely according to the measure of Christ's gift. Not all the same um, for all people. It's different uniquely for each individual Christian. Now look at verse 8. And then Paul says, therefore he says, now he's quoting from the Old Testament. He says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, a host of captive, and gave gifts to men. Now you might think, you know, what on earth does this mean? And I, I knew you were going to ask the question, what does this mean? How does that fit into the message? Because at first it doesn't really make sense. It, it doesn't... Um, seem consistent but Paul says therefore which means it, it's connected what he's trying to say is actually based on what he's quoting here in verse 8 so let me sort of um, unpack this for you and you need to stay with me because there's a lot actually packed into this um, and you know, to, to get as much out as possible you need to focus and pay attention this verse is quoted from Psalm 68, 68 verse 18 to be precise. And Psalm 68 is known as um, the victory psalm or victory hymn. It is a song that the Israelites were singing after having victory given by God. This particular psalm was the psalm of David. That David is conquering the land of Israel. You know the story of David. David became king. Um, he has some time of fleeing from Saul, but when he actually became king after Saul's death, he actually um, spent a lot of time conquering all the tribes and neighboring lands. Now, to sort of rewind back to the time of Exodus, they went to the land of Canaan. But at first, when they went into the land of Canaan, God said, kill them all, destroy them all, and conquer the land, because God said he gave the land to them. But they did not obey fully. They left some of the people still um, you know, stay in that land. And, and that became ongoing problems and troubles. So when David became king, he was determined to conquer all these regions and to claim all the land that God promised Abraham as the land of Israel. And one of them was to go and capture the city uh, in a, a Jebusite region. So Jebusite city which became the city of Jerusalem. 
So Jerusalem city, the city of Jerusalem, was actually a pagan city before it became Jerusalem. So when they actually went and conquered the land, the city, and the Jebusite city became Jerusalem, they're singing the victory hymn. They're, they're singing the Psalm 68. And in one of the, the verses in Psalm is this very verse, verse 18, which says, when he ascended on high, that in Psalm originally refers to God, when God ascended on high, which is basically a synonym for victory. In the ancient days, when you, when you conquer a land, you actually literally go into a high place, whether that's a high hill or on top of a building, and you proclaim that this is now my city or our land. So the kings used to do that, generals used to do that. So when God ascended on high by giving them victory to have the, the, the victory over Jerusalem, he led captivity captive. Now that might sound a little confusing, but it's so much easier if you understand it in this way. The expression led captive is um, actually one kind of expression um, that, that actually means to, to capture. Now to lead captive is to go and capture, whether they are enemy prisoners or your own people who were taken prisoners beforehand during the war, you lead captive, which means you, you to take some people and you capture them and you lead them. So lead captive or led captive or captivity is one expression. That's like one verb. So think of it in this way. That, that's just one verb. And the second word captive is the actual people who are captured. Um, whether they are enemies or whether they are your own people taken as prisoners. So you go and fight the battle and you've got victory and in getting that victory you also get some prisoners and you lead these prisoners captive people a host of captive as your captured people you led captivity the captive so basically it is to capture some people and then the third line and gave gifts to men then in the war context when you go and conquer the, the city Usually you go and, you know, you know, you take the enemy's possession. So you take spoil. And that spoil can be treasure, you know, valued items, um, you know, things that are, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that are wealth of the enemy. And you can actually take that spoil and you can sometimes distribute that spoil. So you give gifts to men. So what's happening in Psalm 68 is that they're singing the victory, victory psalm, victory hymn. And they're saying, God gave us victory. He ascended on high. And he allowed us to capture our prisoners or our people who were taken prisoners to sort of, you know, free them now. And also we have all these gifts, the spoils from the enemy. So they're singing this victory hymn, victory psalm. That's what David is singing. That's the original context. But how does that fit here when we talk about the diversities of gift? Now move on to verse 9. You'll see in verse 9 there is a little bracket all the way to verse 10. So verse 9 and 10 in brackets, which means Paul's simply explaining how this fits into this situation. Now this, Paul says, he ascended. What does it mean? Except that, you know, but, that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now let's stop there and just think about what this means. Paul is saying, it says he ascended. But how can he ascend unless he first descended and descended into the lower parts of the earth? So before you ascend, before you go up, you have to go down. So uh, Paul saying, yes, Christ ascended, but before that he had to descend and descend into the lower parts of the earth. Now the phrase lower parts of the earth, we have to understand what that means before we can put it in sort of full, fuller meaning. The lower parts of the earth is an expression that's found in the Bible, about four places. And each of these is actually very, very important, and it teaches us something very, um, very crucial here. Now, the expression, first of all, is used in Psalm 139, verse 15. You, know, you don't need to look up that verse, just maybe write it down if you want to look up later. Psalm 139, 139 verse 15, talks about that God making us and creating us as a wonderful creation in the mother's womb. Now that's written by David. So David's basically saying, God made me um, and created me in the, my mother's womb. And that womb 
is referred to the lower parts of the earth. It's like darkness. So that's one thing that it can mean. The lower parts of the earth is to be conceived in the mother's womb in more kind of secluded, sort of you know, protected and dark place. And secondly, that phrase is also used in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 23. And in that verse, it simply refers to the created world. The lower parts of the earth refers to, as opposed to the heaven where God is, this is basically the world that, that God has created. So it can mean the created world or our life in this created world, all the life, all the living things in this created world. And thirdly, that verse is also quoted from, uh, it quoted in Psalm 63, verse 9. In Psalm 63, verse 9, David is talking about his enemy, and he's using that expression to talk about execution, to kill or murder by execution. So it's death. So to go to, or to descend into the lower parts, parts of the earth is to die. And usually it is um, that your life is taken away, so either by murder or execution. And fourthly, in New Testament, in Matthew twelve forty, the lower parts of the earth is used in the story of Jonah. As Jesus is telling them the story of Jonah, he says that Jonah spent three days in the lower parts of the earth, which was actually the fish's belly. He was swallowed up by the fish, spent, there in, spent, in, spent three days in the, the belly of the fish, and that's actually um, referred to, that, that's referring to the burial of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is talking about the resurrection. Um, and the only sign that I can tell you is the sign of Jonah. And just as Jonah spent three days in the darkness in the lower parts of the earth, Je Jesus, the Son of Man, Son of God, will be also in, in the tomb buried for three days before he rises from the dead. So it talks about conception in the womb. It talks about this created world, and it talks about the death by execution, and it talks about the burial. And can you see that the lower parts of the earth refers to all that Christ went through in his humanity? Christ was conceived in the Virgin Mary as a baby. He was born and he lived human life, perfect human life in this world. And then he died because he was crucified and he was buried for three days. So to say that before he ascended, he had to first descend into the lower parts of the earth. Paul is simply saying, look, Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, after the resurrection, he first had to be conceived in the womb and become a human being and live perfect life in this created world of God and to die through crucifixion and execution on the cross and to be buried in the tomb for three days. And after that, only after that, because he has descended now, he can now ascend into heaven and have the final victory. So this is really rich. I mean, this, this has to be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Paul was able to quote this verse from Psalm 68 and use it to describe that Christ has descended and ascended into heaven. But of course, that's not all, because the third line says, the, and he, he says, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men in verse 8 in Ephesians chapter 4. So he ascended into heaven, and before that, of course, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, but he ascended into heaven, and he gave gifts to men. If you look at verse 10, he says, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Now, simply Paul's describing, explaining how this fits into the, the point. Yes, first he ascended, but before that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. And the one who descended is also the one who ascended afterwards far above all the heavens. So this is the ascension into the heavens to the throne of God. So that he might fill all things. Fill what things? Fill all things refers to the filling each believers with the gifts that he gives. 
in its context. Because in verse 7, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is a picture of Christ filling or pouring according to the measure that he has to each believer. Now, take, take a little pause and think about this. So how does that all fit together? You need to be thinking, because if you simply listen to me, I don't think it'll make much sense. And even if it does, you'll probably forget shortly afterwards. But if you think, it might last a little longer. So think about this. Christ has given each of us diversities of gifts. And for that to happen, he had to ascend and have victory to give gifts. Because the spoiled gifts can only be given once you have victory. So Christ has to have victory and ascend into heaven in order to give you gifts. Give us gifts. But before he ascend into heaven, he had to actually first descend into the lower parts of the earth. That means he had to die for the sin of, of in our sins and, and for our salvation. So he died, he ascended, and then once he ascended, he has given gifts to us all, uniquely to each one of us. Now that is not only talking about our salvation through Jesus Christ, but it is actually talking about Christ giving us gifts at the same time. At the moment of your salvation, Christ gives each true believer unique and diversities of gifts. And that gifts obviously um, you know, may not be visible or manifested straight away, but it will over the life of that believer. But Christ has given each believer that gifts or uniquely um, you know, give unique giftedness to each believer. And that comes with salvation. And that means, if you put it all together, it actually means that Christ, in order to give us gifts, he had to ascend. That, but before he ascended into heaven, he had to descend into the lower parts of the earth. So can you now see that Christ died not just or barely for our salvation. He actually died to secure our gifts, to give each of us gifts by Christ's measure. Put it another way. He purchased our gifts with his life. You might remember the verse in Acts chapter 20. He says, the church of God, which, purchased, which was purchased by his own life, for the life of Christ. The church, that's us, was purchased by Christ. So Christ paid the price. Christ paid the price with his life to purchase us. But he not only barely purchased us, but he purchased our gifts to give us those gifts. Because in verse 8, remember that he led captivity captive, that phrase? That actually means you go and capture the prisoners. And in some contexts, um, it's to actually capture back your own people who are taken prisoners by your enemy. So that you can release them, you can give them freedom. You can imagine these soldiers were captured during the war, or some people, even civilians, captured during the war. They are now captured back by your own people and they are brought back to their own families and you know great reunion and that's the picture of salvation God actually delivers us from the enemy the, the, the last enemy that as we have read in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 is the, the death he has released us from death and sin he has delivered us from the enemy's hand the death and sin and he has now brought us back to the actual family in Christ, the church. So it's like saying God ascended on high. And in, in all of that, everything is included that we've talked about. Before he ascended, he descended to the lower parts of the earth. And then he ascended. And he not only acquired um, or purchased our salvation, but also he purchased our gifts. And he led captivity captive. And that's a picture of delivering people. This is a picture of saving people. And then he gave gifts to men. 
So God saved us by delivering us from sin and death, and now He gave gifts to His people. And that's actually what, that, that's all that is, verse 8, 9, and 10. That's what Paul is trying to say from this verse. So again, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he left captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does this mean? Except that he also descended into lower parts of the earth. He who descended also is the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So I hope you, you can actually see that. Um, and that's what it means. And once you unpack all that means, um, you, know, you, you can see so much richness in here. And you, un you understand that you know, Christ did not just or barely die for our salvation. It's not just like, you know, um, if this is what the price was for our salvation, Christ gave just enough to purchase our salvation. No, he, he actually gave way more than that. And it's more, much more than was required even to secure our gifts. And he has given gifts to all men. So when you were saved, you received eternal life, obviously. But when you were saved, you also received all the gifts. And these gifts are at work throughout your Christian life. And some of you might be using your gifts well and maybe even to the fullest but some of you might not because you don't develop your gifts. You don't perhaps even know what your gifts are because you haven't tried or because you just you know, haven't learned or you, you didn't um, you know, take the initiative. But some of you might do that and use your gifts and develop your gifts and realize that God has given you certain gifts that you may you know, not even have known before. But you realize that you're actually you know, good at this and you can actually do this to contribute to the church and so on. So all that is included in our salvation. Christ has died. Including living as a perfect human to purchase us for eternal life and also purchased our gifts to give to each one. And if you think about that, it, it's um, so logical, isn't it? I mean, what good is it if you buy, say, for example, uh, a car as a present but there's no fuel. You can't drive it. You know, when, when you buy a car as a present, you, know, you want to make sure that the car is drivable, so the car has fuel and you know, all the things that's necessary, but also it is registered and you've got the insurance. Because if you can't drive it, what good is it if you have a car? I mean, it's not good just um, you know, letting it sit in your garage. You have to drive your car. To live your Christian life it's not just enough to save someone and say, now you know, you've got eternal life and see you in heaven. Christ gives us all that we need to unleash full potential to live as a, a Christian, uh, you know, effective Christian, using your gifts. And he has given us all. He has given us all. And when you use those gifts... And when you have the diversities of gifts in the church, then that promotes the unity of the church. And that builds up the church. Now we have to get through all that to come to our main point today, actually. And our main point is in verse 12. Now, um, let, let's bypass verse 11. We understand that verse, but there's a lot more we can talk about in verse 11, which we'll do later. But... For the sake of our exercise today, we'll have a look at verse 12. It says, for the equipping of the saints. So Christ gives all these teaching gifts to some people for the equipping of the saints. So these people, apostles all the way to the teachers, these people equip the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, these people, um, some specifically gifted people, equip and teach the saints so that they can do the work of ministry. We understand that. Uh, we've, we've talked about that before many, many times. And that means each member, now putting it all together, each member is given gifts. So each member can do the work of ministry for the benefit of the church. In other words, every church member is a working member. 
What is the title of the sermon today? Can you see in your bulletin? What's the title? Working member or working members. Working members. Simple. Members or church members are working people working for the church. There is no non-working member. I mean, I, I don't know, um, I don't think we can put that into sort of in writing, but if any member of our church stops working for the church, then that person ceases to be a member of the church in practice. If you simply come and if you're a spectator, then you're not a member of this church. You're a visitor. You're a spectator. As a member, you've got to be working for the church. And understand that everything else exists for that purpose. Is that too much to say? Your work, your career, your family, your hobby, everything else that you do, can we say that they exist for this purpose? Is church that important in your life? Or is church like something that you do on the sideline? Is it just an accessory? If that's how you view, you know, getting involved in church ministry may be optional. And if that's what it is, then you're not ready to be a member, or you're not functioning as a member of the church. Maybe you know, you're not saved, and that may be the reason, the foundation reason. But if you're saved, as we have just studied, Christ has given you gifts already. I mean, what good is it if you have gifts, but if you don't use those gifts? He has given you gifts so that you can use those gifts and continue to develop and use your gifts over your Christian life so that you can use them for the benefit of the church and for the unity of the church and that's basically the ultimate goal for every Christian and everything else is a kind of secondary or periphery things that help that so your work, your career you, know, you go and work and you earn money you might develop your career you can excel and learn some skills you, you do all of that so that you can actually use your gifts for the church. In terms of our time, you know, we may not be able to do that full time all the time for all of us. We understand that. The Bible doesn't say that everybody is called to full time ministry. But some are, like these apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and prophets. But most Christians are still in their contexts. But just because you spend much more time in your workplace doesn't mean that you can be deceived into the lie that that's all your life is worth. It's not. Your career is important, but it's there to serve this very purpose, the ultimate goal as a Christian, to serve in the church, to work in the church, to work for the church, so that you are in ministry, your own ministry, and you can promote the unity of the church and you can build up the church. In terms of time, you might spend more time in your workplace, in your family. But in terms of the actual intensity, you might be doing a lot more for the church. That's how it should be. You put your heart and your mind and your focus onto the work of ministry that God has given you. And you need to be equipped to do that work. And every church member who is genuine member because of genuine salvation has to be working all the time because... Christ has given you gifts to do the work of ministry. Look at verse 16. From whom the whole body, the one body of Christ, the church, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Now this is a picture of the members of the body working together. And you can see that all the supplies come through every joint. It may not come directly from the head. In other words, my hand is moving and doing its function because it is connected to the arm, not head. I mean, if I stick everything to my head because this is where the original instruction comes from, then that would be a monster. But all the members of the body are connected to each other and they get all the nourishment and instruction from, and from the head but through the joints and nerves and ligaments and muscles and so on. And likewise, as a church, you get the supplies from Christ, but through, as often it is the case, other people in the church, the members of the church. You get supplies from the people who teach the word of God, 
You get supplies also from fellow members who help each other and pray for one another and fellowship with one another. You get supplies through other members and through the joints, and they work together. And look at verse 16. So that's how the body works. And he says, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. You see that? Every part does its share. What is your share? What is your share in this church? What is your portion? What is your ministry? I'm sure that most of you, I, I mean, I can see that all of you are involved in some work, but most of you, I can tell you pretty safely that, um, that you can still you know, explore more because there's still untapped gifts that you are not using yet, which we hope that you will be using in due time more and more to the full effectiveness. And that's what growth is, to be growing in the use of your, of your gifts. Now that's another way to sort of measure your growth and to describe your growth. So all that to say is that every member has a share. Every member has a part to play. Every member is working. And that is our aim. That is the aim of church membership. Again, go, go back to the very basic things. Church membership is not like club membership. You know, we're not talking about some benefits and some rights. We're more talking about being a member of the body of Christ and therefore you are doing the part and your share as a member of the body of Christ. If you're a member, then you work and you contribute. And we don't want any member who does not contribute, only sapping the, the energy from other people. Of course, you know, there are people who are not members yet because they're probably they're not saved or they're saved and they're in the process. Now, those people need to be supported and they need to be supplied and we work you know, to preach the gospel to them and to help them and to be nourished and to grow in faith. But once you become a member, then you are to contribute. You are to contribute and grow in the contribution more and more. We have no guests here. We have no strangers here. In chapter 2, verse 16, 19, 19. You are no longer strangers or foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Your fellow citizens and members of the household of God. You are members and we have no guests. In a sense, um, you know, we were hoping that we would have more people in this retreat. So we originally thought maybe up to 30 people, but it just happens that we've got about half of the number. But I think that's actually God's providence because people who will be coming to this retreat this time are all, in a sense, members or people who are committed to our membership. So we can actually talk about these things more intentionally. We can actually pray about how we can be more useful for the church. And you can be thinking about your part and how you can contribute to the church, how you can do your share. So it'll give us a give us a much, much more focused time to think about that. I mean, it's good that we are um, together on the weekend and enjoying each other's company, the nature, even campfire, eating together, fellowshipping with one another. That's all good, but you know, they, they are bonus. The real purpose and the real theme is to understand and to culminate this church membership program that we have so that we now explore using our gifts how we can be effective and useful for the ministry in the church and how we can promote church unity. And we can now talk about that without any reservation with each other this time because we've got members, basically. And we will induct all of us into church membership at the end of the church retreat and um, you know, we can you know, talk more intentionally about that and towards that. So there's no guest, no strangers. We are all working members of our church. But there's one big condition. You might even say that this is a big caveat, if you use that word. What do you need to do the work effectively? So if you are all working members, what do you need to be working more effectively? I mean, you can think about that, but I'd rather have you 
look at your Bible because it comes from the scripture. Verse 12. That's our memory verse, isn't it? Verse 12. Now verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So if you want to do the work of ministry, if the saints need to do the work of ministry, they need what? They need? Can you see that in the text? What, what do they need? Is your mind blank or are you all here? What does it say? What, what did I just read? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the work of ministry, what do we need? Equipping of the saints. What is equipping specifically? What do these five or four offices do in verse 11? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, what do they do? What's one common thing that they do for the saints? They teach. They teach the word of God. Equipping or maturing, that's like to make complete, but they do that by teaching the word of God. Now teaching in a broader sense, not just giving information, but setting examples and helping and sort of tutoring them and discipling them, that's all included. But they do that, they do the teaching so that they can be equipped for the work of ministry. In other words, you need to be equipped to do the work of ministry. Now just because we talked about using gifts and working members, if you just go off and say, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that, and you, you are involved in this ministry or that ministry, if you're simply busy doing things without really learning and equipping yourself, then you, you know, very soon will run out of your you know, steam or gas or energy. And you begin to complain. You begin to be proud. You begin to be disappointed when people do not acknowledge you. You begin to grumble. You know, why is it that I'm the only one doing all this work? You know, why aren't other people doing the same work? And sometimes you hope that people will acknowledge you and you know, sort of, you know, give you some compliment. And if that doesn't happen, you become very disappointed and very depressed. And you become, you become even offended and, and you don't even do the same work the next time. That's inevitably what happens if you keep on working, which is good, but without feeding yourself with the Word of God. So one big condition is, yes, you've got to be all working, but you've got to be equipping yourself. You've got to be learning and feeding yourself with the spiritual food, the Word of God. Let me put it another, in another way. The most important work is to study the Word of God. The most important work that you must be doing all the time is to study the Word of God. And plus, you can use your gifts to do all the other things. And for some people, learning and studying and teaching may be their major gift. Like pastors and teachers. Because that's what they are gifted in. So they do that most times. But that's not everybody. And people are gifted in different ways. So you may be learning, but your gift, your major gift may be in other areas. Other areas of serving, whatever that might be. And in fact, you know, I'd encourage you to, to think about that and to talk about that during the retreat. So you can actually find some of your gifts, perhaps some gifts that you may not realize, but others might affirm and say that, you know, brother or sister, I think you would be really good at this. Or oh, give it a try. Um, Perhaps Christ has given you some gift in this area. So use that time during the retreat to think about your gifts and how you can use those gifts to serve the church. But undergirding all of that is the continual learning of God's Word. And you know what that involves. Learning involves reading, reading on your own, reading together, and memorizing Bible verses and understanding what it means and reading good books, going to Bible studies, and listening to sermons, doing some personal studies, but also studying together collectively and corporately together in the worship services and Bible studies, 
And all these things that we do, men's Bible study, you know, women's um, discipleship groups, and women's Bible study, and book study, and you know, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, I think Saturday and Sunday is Saturday and Sunday, you know, book study, and Friday, home fellowship. And all these um, church activities and ministries are there to equip us. And you can go and serve and use your gifts. And that's why um, some Christians use the term very um, you know, frequently, and the term is student of scripture. We are all students of God's word. We are all students of scripture. You are learning always. And that's your work. That's part of your work. That's the foundational work. And you can go and do the work by using your gifts. And as you do that, you're both learning and doing and by doing all of that, you become more and more like Christ. And to be Christ-like is the ultimate goal. Remember that? To be more and more like Christ. Now this re retreat, I'm sure, will be a really blessed time. And, and let's really focus on this and, and make sure that we don't get distracted or that our focus is diffused in any way. But let's actually more sort of focus and, and more in intensify our learning and our time together so that we can continue to learn the Word of God and also keep working always as members of God's church. I'm sure the Lord will bless us uh, abundantly during this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our loving God and our Father. And we are all your children, all members of the household of God, all saved with the same salvation and same Christ. But we've received all diversities and different unique gifts. And they are all given to us for promoting the unity of the church. We've just learned that. May we always be focused on this intentionally and not let that be diffused by anything else. We thank you that you have made us in different ways. We thank you for our ethnic diversities and cultural diversities, and we are so enriched by that experience. But we pray that even they can be used to promote the unity of the church. And as we exercise our diversities of gifts with different and unique backgrounds and contexts, but always remembering that these diversities ought to promote the unity of the church. And our gifts are given to us for the common good of the church. May we use them and ex exercise them for your glory, but also for the benefit of the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.